This process works through the finite element analysis process for a truss model. It's very similar to the bar finite element model that we previously looked at, but in this case we introduced the transformation step as well. Here's the example that we're going to be working through. It's a 3-4-5 triangle truss. There are simply two elements shown here. We have a load, vertical load of one kilonewton acting on the right end, and the two elements are attached at the left side to a, uh, a wall. The element properties are given, and the first step in the process is to define the model. Here we're going to identify the nodes and then the element numbers. Once we have these, we can go and find element stiffness matrices, move on and find equivalent nodal force vectors, assemble the global stiffness matrix and the global force vector, apply the boundary conditions, solve the problem, and do some post-processing to find reactions and stresses. I'll make a quick note here, step three, we're gonna be able to skip past because there are no distributed loads acting on these truss elements. Once I've defined the model, I can go through and find the stiffness matrix for each element. Element one is a horizontal member. That means that its x-axis and the global x-axis are most likely aligned. And that means that the angle between them is zero. The angle is important because if you recall from an earlier video, we developed this matrix as the standard stiffness matrix for a truss element where C represents cosine and S represents sine. So this particular element has a C equal to one and an S equal to zero. So it's going to be a pretty simple matrix once we fill it out. Uh, first off though, let's look at the term out front, AE over L. For this element, A is 10 to the minus fourth meter squared, E is 500 megapascals, and L is one meter as given in the problem definition. So AE over L is 50 kilonewtons per meter, and our overall stiffness matrix for element one is as shown. We're gonna follow the same process for element two, but we're going to have different cosines and sines because we have a different angle in this case. Element two is pointed upward and to the left or downward and to the right, depending on how you want to define it. The global x-axis remains the same, it's horizontal. So we need to define the angle between this global x-axis and the local x-axis. The question is, does the local x-axis point up and to the left or down and to the right? And it turns out that is your choice when you're setting up the model. I strongly recommend that when you're doing a problem by hand, you always choose to go from the lower index node number to the upper because then your columns and rows will be in order of your global numbering system. So the, the, two, the first two columns are gonna to correspond to the first node of this element. I'm going to call the first node two because it's a smaller number than three. So my first two rows in this matrix are going to be D2X and D2Y, and the second, or the third and the fourth column rather, are going to be D3X and D3Y. And that just conceptually makes sense when you're solving the problem by hand. With this approach where node two comes before node three, that establishes my X prime direction, my local X direction. And then I can get the angle between the global and the local of 143 degrees, which allows me to get the cosine and the sine um, for that relationship. So cosine or C is minus four fifths and S is three fifths. The AE over L out front for this element, A is the same, E is a little bit smaller, and L is a little bit larger. In the end, I get an AE over L that is 25 kilonewtons per meter. Putting that into the formula shown on the lower right here, I get 25 kilonewtons per meter times the squares and CS terms, and multiplying that all out, I have the matrix shown on the lower left here. So this is now my stiffness matrix for element two. Whenever you have a truss element that is at an angle to your global axes, you're always going to fill in all of these terms in the matrix, it'll be a full matrix. After finding element stiffness matrices, the next step would normally be to find the element force vector for any distributed loads, but as I mentioned earlier, we don't have any in this case. So we can jump right to this, the fourth step, assembling the, the elements together. So here are my two element stiffness matrices, and I'm going to label the columns in each case to make sure that it's clear where those terms are going. And you can see that the columns associated with node two, D2X and D2Y, are repeated. So I'm gonna have some overlap here. I'm gonna to have to do some addition between these terms. 
My global matrix is going to have a total of six columns and six rows because I have two degrees of freedom at each of three nodes. And now I'm going to plug in the, the two matrices, the matrix corresponding to nodes one and two, that's matrix or uh, that's element one matrix is going to go into the upper left, upper left, and the matrix corresponding to element two, um, nodes two and three is going to go into the lower right. When I plug those in, I find that I get some overlap in the middle there, and in that overlap, there's actually only one term that ended up needing to be added, and that's for d2x d2x. 50 plus 16 gives me the 66 term. So that sets up my global stiffness matrix, but I'm not done. I also need my global force vector. Again, there is no distributed loading in this case, so my global force vector is straightforward. I have my reaction force terms, and these are the signs are determined based on my choice of how to orient them in my free body diagram. So R1x and R3x, I chose to put those to the left, so I get a negative sign out in front of them. Now that the problem is fully set up, I've got a global system matrix and I've got a global force vector, I need to move to the solution phase. First step there is applying the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are pretty extensive in this problem. I know that there is no displacements at node 1 or at node 3, so that specifies four of my degrees of freedom, or it's going to eliminate four of my equations. The only two equations that I need to solve for the unknown degrees of freedom are equations 3 and 4. I can put those together because all of my other degrees of freedom are zero. Those other terms in the stiffness matrix drop out and I get a two by two matrix. And then I can solve that matrix and get deflection at node two. We see here node two is predicted to move to the left and downward. Both of those are expected under this loading condition. So it fits with our um, preconceived notions of what should happen. Next thing that we want to do is find the reaction forces. To do that, we go back and use those equations that we just ignored. The first and second equations give us the reaction forces at node 1, and the uh, first equation tells us that the reaction at node 1, I chose the wrong direction. It should be acting to the right at 1.33 kilonewtons, and the reaction in the vertical direction is zero. This is because that's a horizontal element that can't have any transverse forces acting on it. So it can't impose any reaction um, in the vertical direction. The last two equations, five and six, give us the reactions at node three. And we find that at node three in the x direction, we get 1.33 kilonewtons. And in the y direction, we get one kilonewton. So these directions make sense, they balance out, statics is satisfied in this problem. The last step is then going to be getting stresses in the elements. For post-processing, we want to get the stresses throughout the model, and we need to go back to each individual element in order to do that. So going back to the element, we're going to use this equation, the sigma vector is equal to the material properties matrix D multiplied by the strain nodal displacement matrix B and then the transformation matrix T star, followed up finally by the degree of freedom vector for this element. So everything's focused on the element that we are considering. Right now, let's look at element one. The transformation matrix, just as a reminder from an earlier video, that's CS0000CS. And for this particular element, C was one and S was zero. So T star is a pretty simple element or um, matrix shown here. In addition, for element 1, L1 is equal to 1 meter. Plugging these terms in, multiplying the, the D times the B, we get a simple row matrix. Multiplying that by the column matrix of the degrees of freedom that are relevant for this element. So we're only looking at degrees of freedom at node 1 and node 2. Get those numbers pulled in, multiply everything out, and we find that the stress in element one is negative 13.35 megapascals. It's compressive as you would expect because it got smaller. And to wrap up our analysis, we then wanna look at the stresses in element two. Going back to the element, we have the same formula here, but now T star is a bit more complicated. It's got uh, negative four fifths for the cosine and three fifths for the sine. So expanding out, this is our, our DB, 
T star little d expression, where here the degree of freedom vector just considers the displacements at nodes 2 and 3 because those are the ones that are connected to element 2. Observing that for this element the length is 5 fourths meters, we multiply out b times t star and we get a row vector and again we multiply and we get 16.63 megapascals is the tension in element 2. Now this number is not significantly larger than the stress in element 1, but remember that element 2 was less stiff. It had a smaller um, E, and that has a significant impact on the, the magnitude of the stress that we're going to see.